By far, the most interesting book I read this past summer was a book called Generations by Gene Tweeney. Now, some of you have heard me talk about this book already, and some of you have heard me talk a lot about this book. I'm pretty sure, yes, I know, Pastor Jeremy and Clay are tired of hearing me talk about this book, but I can't help it because the content is just so fascinating to me. The book is all about the similarities and differences between the generations currently alive today, starting with the silents who were born before 1945 and ending with a brief word about the alphas who were born after 2013. Dr. Twingy has compiled tons of research and data into this 500 plus page book to help us all understand our own generation better and the generations that come before and after us. So if you've ever wondered why silence and boomers let their little bitty five-year-old Gen X kids roam all over town on their bikes till it got dark, but now as parents, Gen Xers track their teenagers every move on an app, then you should read the book. Or if you've ever wondered why Gen Zers are taking so long to get their driver's licenses or why every millennial seems to be anxious, then you should read the book. But as fascinating as the book is from a sociological perspective, as I was reading it, I couldn't stop thinking about what it could be like if somehow we could bring the best of every generation together in one place. What would happen if we brought together the wisdom of silence and boomers and the grit of Gen X and the zeal of millennials and the energy of Gen Z? What would happen if we could unite these generations together in one place for one purpose with one set of shared values, morals, and beliefs? What might it look like if every generation encouraged one another to bring out their best? Would it even be possible to find such a place in our modern fractured society? Well, the Apostle Paul clearly tells us in this letter to Pastor Titus that such a place does in fact exist. There is a place where all generations come together for one purpose, with one set of shared morals and beliefs to encourage one another to bring out their best. That place is called the local church. In this letter, the Apostle Paul instructs Pastor Titus on what his role as a pastor should be and how he is to disciple the church to live in a distinct way in the midst of a despicable world. Titus was serving as a pastor on the island of Crete, which was notorious in the Roman Empire for its wickedness. And as if it wasn't already bad enough, there were false teachers going around the island spreading heresy. So what is Pastor Titus to do about all this? Well, Paul tells him here in chapter two what to do. The big idea Paul wants to communicate to Pastor Titus living in the first century and what the Holy Spirit wants to communicate to us living in the 21st century is this. Pastors are to disciple the church to behave, believe, and belong in a distinct way from the rest of the world. Or to put it another way, compared to the rest of the world, the church behaves in a distinct way believes in a distinct way, and belongs in a distinct way. And it's the pastor's job to disciple them toward that end. What we need to know from this text is what is that distinct way? What is it that brings all of us together in spite of our generational differences and distinguishes us from the rest of the world? The first truth we'll see in this text is the distinct way the church behaves. That's Paul's focus in verses 1 to 10. Look with me beginning in verse 1. But as for you, Pastor Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now, just before this section in chapter 1, Paul describes the Cretan heretics who were teaching that which leads to spiritual death. In contrast, Pastor Titus is to teach that which leads to spiritual health, that which is sound. That's what that word means. It could be translated healthy. We still use the word sound in that way today when we say things like, they came back from their trip safe and sound. 
What we mean is they came back unharmed, in good condition, healthy and strong. So here, the word could be translated spiritually healthy and strong. Faithful pastors are to teach, or we could even say disciple, the church in a way that leads to spiritual growth. Pastors must be able to teach spiritually healthy doctrine, as we see in Titus 1.9, and teach the spiritually healthy behavior that goes along with that doctrine, as we see here. Paul goes on to describe what that spiritually healthy behavior is, what that distinct way is the church is to behave in the next verses. And he organizes this standard of behavior by different age groups. He first begins with older men in verse 2. Older men are to be sober-minded, which means rational and level-headed. They're to be dignified, which means mature and respectable. Doesn't mean older men can't have fun, but it does mean they don't act like fools. And they are to be self-controlled, which is such an important and distinct characteristic of the church that it is repeated in some form or fashion for every single group in this section. In the original language, it's a combination of the word to preserve and the word for abdomen. Because the ancients identified the abdomen as the sort of inner control center of all of our will and desires. And so even to this day, we'll still say things like we have a gut feeling. But more often today, we speak about the heart and the mind as our inner control center of our desires and of our will. And so someone who has self-control has preserved. They, they have control over their heart and their mind. To be self-controlled means we never let our will and our desires overrule God's will and God's desires for us. So older men, along with every group in the church, are to be self-controlled and to be sound. There's that word again. To be spiritually healthy and strong in faith in love, and in steadfastness. In the church, older men should be admired for their strong faith in Jesus, their love for God and for others, and for their spiritual grit. And by God's grace here at Ashland Church, we have many older godly men like this. Men like Glenn Pruitt and Jim Martin and so many others who I look up to and who I hope to be like when I become an older man. Next, Paul addresses the older women, who, like the older men, are to be examples of spiritual maturity. Verse 3, older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Older women are to have self-control, especially with the words that come out of their mouths and the beverages that go into their mouths. They are not to use their mouths to complain or talk bad about others, but rather use them to teach what is good. And so train the young women, who are the next age group Paul addresses. Older women are to train the young women to love their husbands and children. In a day and age when most women did not choose their husbands, and when most children were viewed more like personal property rather than like special snowflakes, Younger women needed the help of older women to love their families well. And to this day, women still marry sinners and still give birth to sinners. And so they still need the help of older women to help them love their families well. When moms are dissatisfied with their husbands or tired of taking care of their kids, they need older godly women in their lives who can point them to their perfect husband, Jesus, who perfectly satisfies them, and to their perfectly heavenly father, who always is taking care of their needs. Older women are to train younger women to love their families, to be self-controlled, pure, and working at home. Paul's concern here is not so much whether she is a stay-at-home mom or a work-outside-the-home mom. His concern is that Christian moms are not lazy party-outside-the-home moms like many of the younger women in their surrounding culture at that time. Younger women are to be hardworking, first and foremost at home and then wherever else they might choose to work beyond that, just like the Proverbs 31 woman. And finally, they are to be kind and to be submissive to their own husbands. 
Paul gives one reason why at the end of verse five, that the word of God may not be reviled. This is the first of three times in this paragraph that Paul gives us a reason for this distinct behavior. And all three reasons have to do with a positive reputation of the church, protecting that reputation, and making the gospel attractive to the watching world. This picture of older godly women discipling younger women towards greater godliness is the vision behind our church's women's ministry which at one time was called T2W, or Titus to Women. And even though now it goes by the much clearer name of Ashland Women, the goal is still the same. And as I look around at the older women in our church, and don't worry, this time I'm not going to name any names, but as I look around at the older women and the younger women, I see what Paul is describing right here in our text. It seems like every time I go to Purdy's, I see women from our church getting together, not because they're slaves to much coffee, but because they are meeting together to disciple one another, to encourage one another toward greater godliness. Almost every day throughout the week, there are women teaching other women in Bible studies and equip groups, and monthly at our women's gatherings. Now, When Paul gets to the distinct way younger men are to behave compared to the world in verse six, you might be surprised that all he says is, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. But by giving the younger men the same quality as he expects of older men, I think he's making the message as clear and as simple as he possibly can. And the message is this, young men, grow up. Stop settling for the low bar of your peers and the low expectations of your culture. Stop acting like self-centered little boys and start acting like self-controlled grown men. By God's grace, step up and be the man Jesus is calling you to be. But verse six is actually not all Paul has to say to young men. In verses seven and eight, he sets the expectations for another young man, Pastor Titus. Paul writes, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. As a pastor, Titus will be held to a higher standard than his peers. He is to be an example to the whole flock of what it looks like for spiritually healthy behaviors and beliefs to be lived out in real life. And this is an important reminder for Clay and I as we prepare for our ordination service. And for any man who aspires to the office of pastor, we are held to a higher standard, Paul says in verse eight, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. By their sinful behavior, pastors and leaders in the church can have a particularly devastating effect on the reputation of the church and the gospel. The ancient pagan Cretans and modern pagan Americans think they have plenty of reasons to talk bad about the church. Pastors do not need to give them any more reason by failing to live up to the high standard of behavior and teaching to which we have been called. But what is true of pastors is also true of everyone else in the church, even those whom society thinks have little to no influence. Paul addresses the behavior of slaves last in verses nine and 10, probably because they were at the bottom of the social order in the Roman Empire, but also because in the Roman society, they could be male or female or old or young. He says, bond servants or slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn or beautify or make attractive the doctrine of God our Savior. Now, this is really remarkable when you think about it because what Paul is saying here is that the Christian slaves who were trustworthy and worked hard who had self-control and didn't talk back to their masters or steal from them, 
Those Christian slaves would make the gospel more attractive to the whole world. So if that is true, if that was true back then for slaves, how much more true is that for us today as employees and students in a culture that has almost completely lost the Protestant work ethic? Listen, trust me, if, even if your job is to collect trash or clean toilets, the Christian employees and students who work hard, who keep their word, who go above and beyond what is expected of them will profoundly influence many bosses and coworkers and teachers and classmates who would never listen to the gospel otherwise. This is the distinct way older men and women, younger men and women, and everyone who works are to behave compared to the rest of the world. Paul summarizes this distinct way in verse 12 by saying, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The pastor's job is to disciple the church to behave in this distinct way from the rest of the world. But as we have seen, it is also the job of the whole church to disciple one another, to behave in this distinct way. Older women discipling younger women, older men discipling younger men. Just as we see Paul doing right here with this letter. Paul, an older man, is discipling Titus, a younger man, by teaching him through this letter. So as Clay and I become pastors, one of the expectations you should have from us is that we will be focused on discipling you and helping you to disciple others to live in a distinctly Christian way in the midst of our sinful world, here in Richmond and to the ends of the earth. Like Pastor Titus, we are to disciple the church to behave in a distinct way and to believe in a distinct way. That's what we see next in verses 11 through 14. In verses 2 through 10, Paul explains the distinct way the church is to behave. And in these verses, 11 through 14, he explains the distinct way the church is to believe. These distinct beliefs are the reason for our distinct behaviors. Paul already gave us a few reasons why the church ought to behave in a distinctly Christian way, like maintaining the reputation of the church and making the gospel more attractive. But here in these verses, he gives us the reason why. We know that's what he's doing here because he begins this one long glorious sentence in verse 11 with the word for. For the grace of God has appeared. Or in other words, the reason why the church behaves this way that I've just described is because the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. The grace of God he's referring to is the gospel. He's referring to the first appearance of Jesus Christ when he took on flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary, when he lived the perfect life we were supposed to live and died the painful death we were supposed to die. And when three days later, his heart started beating again, he stood up and walked out of the grave so that everyone who forsakes their sin and trusts in him alone by God's grace will have salvation. That is the gospel. That is the good news of the grace of God that Paul says here brings salvation for all people. That is, all types of people. All the types Paul just went through. Older men and women, younger men and women, slaves and free. This salvation is freely offered by God's grace to all generations, all classes, and all people groups. The gospel saves us, And it trains us, Paul says in verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. The same gospel that saves us from the penalty of sin is the same gospel that trains us to overcome the power of sin through the work of the Holy Spirit. Our belief in the gospel empowers us to renounce or to deny the sinful ways of our past and to behave in a distinctly Christian way. The distinct kind of way, self-controlled, upright, and godly life Paul described in verses two through 10. This is what we believe and how we behave in the present age while, verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This present age is the time between the times. 
the time we are living in right now between the first appearing of Jesus and the second appearing of Jesus. That's our blessed hope. That's our happy hope. And that's what motivates us to behave in a distinct way. We believe that one day, Jesus, our great God and Savior, will appear. He will return and come back in glory to fully, finally, and forever destroy all sin and sorrow and suffering forever and raise our bodies in a glorified new body to live with him in the new heavens and new earth with never-ending peace and joy. These are the distinct Christian beliefs that separate the church from the rest of the world. And our distinct behaviors come from our distinct beliefs. So, if you're trying to be a good person and clean up your act and act like a Christian, but you've never actually believed the gospel, it's never going to work. You can't fake it till you make it. You can't just try harder. That's not the gospel. The gospel says you can't do it. You can't clean yourself up enough. You can't be good enough. So Jesus did it for you. Forsake your sin and trust in his finished work. And by faith, follow him and let the Holy Spirit transform your life. But the same is true for those of us who are Christians, but who seem to be stagnant in our spiritual growth. The solution is not just to start trying to try harder. You weren't saved by trying harder, and you won't grow by trying harder. What you need is not more work. What you need is more gospel. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you're discipling somebody who struggles with self-control with social media. How can you help them? Well, You could start by showing them all the research that proves that the more time you spend on social media, the more likely you will experience anxiety or depression. You could show them how to set limits on their phones. You could tell them to have social media Sabbaths. You could do all that, sure. And some of that would probably be helpful. But if that's all you do, then you still haven't dealt with the root issue in their heart that's causing the lack of self-control. Because ultimately, the reason why people lack self-control with social media or with their phones or with food or money or sex or with whatever, the reason why people lack self-control is because they are looking to something to give them what only the gospel can give them. So more than they need to take apps off their phones, they need you to take them into God's word and meditate on the glory of the grace of God in the gospel. Because when they are so full of joy, because they have a deeper understanding of what it really means that all their sins are forgiven, then that little dopamine hit they get from a certain number of likes or views will pale in comparison. When they are so full of satisfaction because they have a deeper appreciation for what it means to be approved by God, then they won't need the fake approval of their phony followers. Whatever the case may be, the solution to a lack of self-control is not just try harder. The solution is believe the gospel. Remember, our distinct behaviors come from our distinct beliefs. That is what distinguishes the church from the rest of the world. And that's why as pastors, Clay and I are always going to be bringing you back to the gospel. Whether it's how Clay leads us through worship or how I lead us on mission, everything is going to be about knowing Jesus better, about going deeper into the gospel and about making the gospel known because it is our belief in the gospel that sets us apart from the world. And it's the gospel that truly changes us to be the best we can possibly be. By believing in a distinct way, the church behaves in a distinct way. But there's more to it than that. 
It's not enough to behave and believe in a distinct way. We must belong in a distinct way. That's what we see in verse 14. Verse 14 is the end of this one long, glorious sentence that Paul began in verse 11. Let's look at it together. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. To redeem someone means to buy them their freedom. The Bible teaches us that we are all sinners. And that doesn't just mean we sin, it means that, but more than that, it means that we are slaves to sin. And as slaves to sin, we can't stop sinning on our own. So Jesus redeems us. He buys us our freedom from sin, here in this verse called lawlessness. And the way he did it was by giving himself. That's how costly it was to redeem you. No amount of gold or no amount of dollars could redeem you. We were redeemed not with gold and dollars, but with flesh and blood with the flesh and blood of God's only son. Jesus gave himself to set us free from slavery to sin, but that's not all. The verse continues. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. By faith in Jesus, he sets us free from sinful works and purifies us to be zealous, to be on fire for good works. But do not miss what he says here about belonging in this verse. Notice the verse says, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. (laughs) These are the most amazing words in the Bible. Because after God redeemed the Israelites from slavery to the Egyptians... In Exodus 19.5, he told them this. He said, if, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. God told them, if they obey him, they will be a people for his own possession. But in the new covenant, Jesus says, I will obey and suffer the penalty for your disobedience. And by faith in me, I will purify for myself a people for my own possession who are zealous to obey me and do good works. Jesus does it all. That's why there's no if in this verse. By faith in the obedient life and death of Jesus, we are his treasured possession. And he purifies us and makes us want to obey him. That means when we believe in Jesus, we belong to Jesus. And when we belong to Jesus, we will want to behave like Jesus. That is what truly distinguishes the church from the rest of the world. Better yet, that is who distinguishes the church from the rest of the world. It's Jesus. Jesus is the one who lived the perfectly self-controlled, upright, and godly life Paul describes in verses 2 through 10 that we were supposed to live. We don't just behave in a distinct way to be moralistic, self-righteous prudes. No, we behave in a distinct way to behave like Jesus. And we don't just believe in a generic set of doctrinal beliefs that set us apart from the world. We believe in Jesus. And when we believe in Jesus, we belong to Jesus. And when we belong to Jesus, that's when we will behave like Jesus. Don't you see? What makes us distinct from the world is Jesus. And notice, Jesus purifies for himself a people. Not peoples, not persons, not individuals. A people. By faith, we belong to Jesus, and by faith, we belong to his people. We belong to his people, the church. When we believe in Jesus, we belong to Jesus, and we belong to his bride. We belong to the family of God. So, even if you came here today alone, 
you are emphatically not alone. Even if you came here alone today because your spouse doesn't love Jesus or because your spouse has already gone on to be with Jesus, you are not alone. Even if you're here alone today because the rest of your family or your parents don't believe in Jesus, you are not alone. Even if you've moved here from another part of the country or you're a homesick college student far from home, you are not alone. You belong to Jesus and you belong to his church. So why not make it official and join this faith family as an accountable member? If you belong to Jesus, then you belong with us. You belong with this faith family. Whether you are old or young, male or female, Gen X or Gen Z, we belong to Jesus and we belong together. And as your new pastors, that is what Clay and I are going to dedicate ourselves to reminding you of. Just like Pastor Jeremy has done for years and years, we are committed to serving Jesus and serving you because we belong to Jesus and we belong to one another. We are going to disciple you to believe in Jesus and behave like Jesus because by God's grace, we belong to Jesus. So you see, by God's grace, the local church is the place where all generations come together for one purpose, to glorify Jesus. The local church is the place where all generations share one set of beliefs, We believe in Jesus. With one set of shared morals, we behave like Jesus. It is the local church where pastors disciple a people who belong to Jesus and to one another. And it is the local church where a people from all generations disciple one another and encourage one another to be the best they can possibly be because we're discipling one another to be more like Jesus. That's what makes us distinct from the rest of the world. By God's grace, we behave like Jesus, we believe in Jesus, and we belong to Jesus. And there is nothing better than belonging to him.